Welcome to McKeldin Library. My name is Daniel Mack. I'm the Associate Dean for Collections, Strategies, and Services at the University of Maryland Libraries. And uh, I want to welcome you to our spring uh, lecture in our Future of the Research Library speaker series. And our speaker today is Matt Barnes. Matt comes from uh, OCLC where he's the uh, Director of Sustainable Collection Services. Uh, he's going to be addressing some issues that we've been really grappling with here in the libraries the last few years and I think are going to be increasingly important issues for us to uh, uh, work with. Um, so I know several of you have been uh, uh, eager to hear this uh, talk. I know that I have. Uh, Matt's been working in the academic library community since 2002. He's held senior level positions at Blackwell Book Services, Ebrary, and ProQuest. He is particularly interested in transforming data into insights that help libraries advance their mission. Matt holds an MBA from Washington State University, a certificate in business analytics from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, and a certificate of database management from the University of Washington. So please join me in uh, welcoming Matt Barnes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan, much appreciated. I don't think I've uh, talked so much in a single day for maybe years, and so uh, I've had quite a few meetings. I've really enjoyed everybody's hospitality. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting underway here. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to have been invited to speak at this series, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to address the issue of sustainable collection management and how it enables the transformation of libraries. As a member of the Sustainable Collection Services team at OCLC, I'm fortunate to have a front row seat to what I see as a major shift uh, in the library community where the nature of collections, the philosophy of space utilization, and even the role that academic libraries fulfill um, are all evolving to meet changing uh, student and user needs. I use the word fortunate very deliberately. Um, in my view, all of us here today have the opportunity to work in this community at a time when we can greatly increase researcher access to information through collective collections and facilitated collections, something that we'll be discussing in a moment. We have the opportunity to expand the scope of collections to support new disciplines where traditional formats may not necessarily fit the bill. Um, we have the opportunity to put libraries more, at the direct, uh, more directly at the center of student success we have the opportunity to offer integrated learning experiences for the students and researchers who are using uh, libraries. And generally, I'd say I believe we have a greater opportunity to add more overall value to our communities. Now, of course, with any major transition, whenever a change is taking place, uh, it's going to require making trade-offs. And some of the trade-offs in this case can be quite difficult. There can be some difficult decisions that are, in some cases, very emotional. Um, and not everyone's going to agree with a agenda of change, particularly if this change involves moving collections, even small pieces of those collections, uh, the print collections, uh, in, in any particular manner. What I hope to convince you of here today uh, is that there is a path forward um, that the opportunity to enhance research libraries through sustainable collection management practices uh, is worth the downside associated with any of the trade-offs that must be made to do so. So today I'd like to start off with a very brief introduction of sustainable collection services. Um, I think this is important so that you know my particular perspective, uh, the point of view I'm coming from, then I'd like to talk about how libraries have been evolving, learning-centered thinking, uh, how libraries have um, essentially um, looked at facilitated collections, and then we'll start moving into some of the more practical aspects of actually moving forward with facilitating these types of transactions. 
Sustainable Collection Services was founded in 2011, and at that time, uh, it was really focused on data-driven deselection in individual libraries for monographs. Uh, this was a pretty narrow focus, and it didn't take long uh, before groups of libraries approached Sustainable Collection Services and began asking for help and decision support for group retention programs and for shared print programs. Um, this eventually drew the interest of OCLC, which was already a partner uh, for with sharing WorldCat data, um, because OCLC wanted to um, expand and extend their programs and their research in shared collections and collective collections. And so in 2015, Sustainable Collection Services was actually acquired by OCLC. Now this was actually a boom for SCS. This provided access to new data elements. Uh, for instance, the OCLC work ID, some of you may be familiar with, it allows us to distinguish among various editions of titles. It gave SCS faster access to WorldCat data. Um, and it provided the resources to extend greatly Greenglass. Um, we were able to add group functionality in 2016, which was specific functionality within the decision support system to um, help those groups that had previously come to us. We'll revisit this later on uh, in this presentation, uh, but in several cases, this group functionality has been used uh, to uh, great effect. Um, and of course, uh, USMAI is currently working with this functionality now, something else that we'll also address soon. Most recently, we've begun looking at journal deselection. Um, uh, right now, this is not within the Green Glass interface we'll be talking about, but print journal deselection is something that we've dipped our toe in uh, the water on this particular area and, and actually completed a project for the Maryland Digital Library uh, in this area. SES has worked with about 300 libraries at this point. This has been some of the largest research libraries. Uh, in, the, in North America, all the way down to highly focused special libraries uh, that have uh, pretty small collections. Um, some of the group projects we've, we've worked with uh, include uh, the Eastern Academic Scholars Trust up in the Northeast, which is kind of an extension of the Boston Library Consortium, uh, and the Michigan Shared Print Initiative. Um, these alone have resulted in over six million retention uh, requests for each of, for each of these group for I'm sorry combined for these groups um, as I mentioned uh, we're very proud to be working with the USMAI uh, and we're also working with Skelp on the West Coast so the inspiration for sustainable collection services actually came from founder Rick Lugg's experience in a previous venture uh, R2 consulting I was also a workflow consultant for libraries at R2 Consulting, uh, and at the time, what we were seeing repeatedly was that libraries were struggling mightily with space uh, considerations. Um, not only was space an issue in that it was the, the supporting the growth of collections was literally crowding out the users and researchers that came to the library to use the collections, um, but it was preventing a lot of libraries from moving forward with a lot of the programs um, that they were interested in putting together, programs like Learning Commons and uh, Space Study Space for Students. Now, I would argue that what we saw at that time with uh, the, I think we could only call rather severe space issues was the peak of the book-centered paradigm, as Scott Bennett would call it. Now, in 2003, Scott Bennett, who was in the 90s the UL at Yale and now focuses on uh, library space consulting, he wrote an article that I would consider probably the seminal article in, in uh, uh, space utilization uh, in libraries. And in this article, he started with some of the earliest libraries, uh, the, the, the reader-centered libraries, some of the very earliest scriptoriums, for instance and move to what I would consider uh, the status quo at this point for many libraries, which is the book-centered paradigm. And this essentially means that the growth of the collection takes precedent. Uh, the primary objective, objective of a book-centered library is to essentially accommodate and maintain and provide access to the print collection, a local print collection. Unlike the reader-centered paradigms of the past, in the book-centered paradigm, there really 
uh, read, uh, readers, users, and researchers are really a secondary uh, consideration. They're accommodated uh, if possible. Now, Bennett argued strongly in this article that the next stage in evolution of libraries is the learning-centered paradigm. And unlike the book-centered paradigm, here the emphasis returned to users in user spaces. And the challenge in the learning-centered paradigm is creating integrated learning experiences that combine the resources available in the library with spaces designed to facilitate this learning. In a learning-centered paradigm, really, the challenge is strike, striking an equitable balance between the immediate access of local collections and the need to facilitate students and researchers. Or another way to look at this in the way I like to think of the difference between a book-centered paradigm and a learning-centered paradigm is under the, the book-centered approach, space planners are asking, how much stuff can I fit in this library? Under the learning-centered approach, space planners are asking, what kind of learning experience do I want to take place in this library? That's a very different mentality. It's interesting, looking at the book-centered paradigm in a little more detail, that despite the fact mass production of books really started to gain steam in the late 1400s, when the late 1400s, when when the printing press was available and paper was being manufactured at a rate that you, know, you could have mass production, um, we didn't really see the book center paradigm pick up in academic libraries, at least in the US, until the 20th century. Um, something happened just before the 20th century that changed the, the thinking and the philosophy about how library space should be utilized. And this led to a lot of stacks that are full of books but not necessarily full of patrons. Now, there's, this is not to suggest that the books don't have value in any way whatsoever, but it is to suggest that perhaps a balance um, had not been struck with this particular approach. Another takeaway that I think is important here is, is those who are looking to find a better balance between these local collections that are taking up a lot of space and user spaces in program and programs that require space for purposes other than stacks is that you're not actually reversing centuries of tradition in libraries if you want to find that balance. This is actually a trend that really has begun in the last 100 years uh, or so. So where do we go and how do we shift from the book-centered approach to the learning-centered approach? Well, uh, in his article, uh, Bennett strongly argued that the library should be the one to play the central role in moving learners through what he called a four-step process that started with basic exposition of a subject, being able to learn something and repeat it, perhaps on a test in some other way. These would be, for instance, undergraduate students who may be coming in and doing real research for the first time and moving up the spectrum to the point where the library has helped create a autonomous, uh, intentional learner. So this is a little abstract, what he was talking about here. There was a good example of what really he meant by that. So in other words, moving from exposition of a subject to an intentional learner is helping a student move from seeing themselves as a history major into somebody who at the top of the spectrum sees themselves as a historian, somebody who can learn autonomously and they're able to add to their field um, using original work and thought based on the resources that were available. And we're going to actually look at some examples of libraries that are helping students move along the spectrum today. It was interesting, Ithaca released their uh, 2016 library survey results just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, has anybody here actually taken a look at this? Dan, take a look, just a couple. Um, uh, I, I thought one of the most interesting survey results in here was in the appendix, actually. And this is where they asked library directors, what are your top priorities? Uh, this may be a little, little difficult to read, but um, on this, uh, in the terms of the priorities of the library directors, uh, four of the top five um, were actually not necessarily related to building physical collections, but were related to many of the things that Bennett would recognize 
as a learning-centered approach to libraries. There are things such as uh, student, you know, spaces, physical spaces for student collaboration, um, you know, helping with student success, sharing of collections uh, with uh, partners uh, in the library community. Uh, interestingly, adding to physical collections at this point, 2016, didn't make the, the top 10 in terms of priorities. Um, adding, uh, see, purchasing print books was actually the, the 16th priority on this list. Now, is this suggesting that print books and print materials are unimportant? That, not at all. It doesn't, su it doesn't suggest that at all. But it does suggest that directors are looking to strike a different balance, perhaps something closer to what Bennett had argued for 13 years earlier when he published his article. So at this point, I've talked about learning centered in a fairly abstract way. What exactly does that mean? And I, I suspect that based on the tour of the library I've had today and many of the conversations, that this concept won't be foreign to you here. You know, there's a lot of uh, activity and a lot of programs that you've put in place that very much capture this concept, at least in my opinion. And so what I would like to do, though, is for the, the sake of this discussion, is add some structure uh, to this idea of what a learning-centered uh, approach is, uh, and then provide some interesting examples that I found. And uh, quite honestly, it wasn't, wasn't very, very hard to find them. A great way to structure this, in my opinion, is using the NMC Horizon Report. Does anybody take a look at this? This is a very interesting report. It's freely available online. I'd suggest you take a look at it if you have any interest in the evolution of learning trends and in particular technology in higher education uh, in general. Uh, they tend to, what they do is they take various trends that they see in learning and they, they rank them as either long-term, mid-term, or short-term, and then they have some very interesting discussions and provide a lot of great examples uh, to the reader. One of the long-term trends uh, that they had was advancing cultures of innovation. So what they mean by that is supporting the exploration of new ideas across learning institutions with specifically designed programs. I think a great example of this and something you'll, you'll recognize uh, is the University of ne Nevada, Reno's makerspace. Now this was recognized as one of the most interesting makerspaces in America. It's received a lot of attention. It was covered by American libraries um, over the last several years. And, and they offer uh, technology and tools that allow students to design and prototype and actually build whatever their imagination has led them to build. I think it's interesting to note in this makerspace, the, the creations that the students have made haven't just been trivial practice exercises, but some of them have actually been patent-worthy inventions. One example was, was a student came in and they built a bike lock that will actually unlock based on the unique grip of that user. This, this was a student who, who created this in this particular makerspace. Another example is a graduate student pulled a fluorescent protein, whatever that is, out of database, and actually created a 3D model of this uh, for instruction in various classes. Uh, and you know, speaking of 3D printers, uh, this is something that we're starting to see proliferate. This is a, a, library, a librarian, Amanda Goodman, actually created a Google map and has asked libraries to self-identify uh, to um, note when they have put a 3D printer uh, in their facility. And right now, there's about 186 uh, ac academic institutions that have 3D printers identified on here. I didn't look to see if, if you guys are actually on this map. You may, may not ha have seen this. Um, but I think that we'll see this explode in terms of the number of libraries hosting this. And so why is that? You know, why is it the library's role to have a 3D printer? Well, well first, if, if you look at these and you look at the impact they're going to have on the future and what people are doing with industry today, you can begin getting a feel for the importance of this um, for learning and uh, resources going forward. There are doctors right now using 3D printers to print organs, like human organs, from a patient's own cells. There are, uh, Ford and General Motors are using these to actually build pieces for prototype cars. NASA is using 3D printers to actually create rocket injector parts. And there are folks who are using 3D printers to print prosthetic limbs for people who have been uh, disabled. I took a tour of the library earlier, as I mentioned, and, and in all honesty, I'm not sure that University of Nevada, Reno has anything on uh, your particular makerspace. It's a fantastic space that you have there. And I asked the 
uh, the gentleman who gave us the, gave me the tour of the space I said, well, have there been any interesting uh, inventions that people have come up with here. He said, well, yeah, there might, here's one that's interesting. And he showed me somebody, uh, somebody, one of the students had an idea to create knives, kitchen knives, that are formed to the unique grip of that person. Well, how did they do it? They took a piece of clay and put their grip in it. They put it on the 3D scanner that's in your maker space. They scanned that, and they're going to put that on a 3D printer and actually print out the, the, the knife handle. Well, that to me is really interesting. I, you know, I, I, I should have thought to ask this, but I wouldn't mind putting that on my Christmas list. I don't know if he's selling it quite yet. But again, this is a student using a library resource. Not necessarily an engineering student, but just someone out on, on the campus and where they were able to use these, these resources. And so the question for the context of this presentation that I think we have to ask ourselves when we think about maker spaces 3D printers, making technology available to the general community regardless of the discipline, is you know, who, whose students are going to do better and, and be better prepared to innovate with these kinds of technology? Institutions where books and articles are provided so that they can read about this technology? Or is it going to be institutions that provide the books and articles and digital assets uh, and the equipment to actually apply it? It's a kind of rhetorical question, but I think you know what I'm obviously arguing for here is that this is a good investment for libraries. So another example in the Horizon Report uh, was talking about deeper learning approaches. And here, again, in a fairly abstract way, they're talking about content that engages students in critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, self-directed learning, and oftentimes addressing real world problems. There's lots of examples here, but I think one of the best, and uh, did anybody attend Charleston this year, Charleston Conference? A few of you. Um, well, uh, I think one of the best examples, which actually won the fast pitch competition at Charleston, uh, is Syracuse University's uh, Blackstone Launchpad. Here, um, they've actually uh, put together an entrepreneur center in the library, and the program introduces students to um, you know, different resources, support, online tools, there's mentorship programs that are involved, and it essentially helps students launch real businesses. And get this, it's not just, again, an abstract, you know, learn, learn from the books and maybe get to apply it someday. It's a combination of the resources of this library being combined with programs, and it's actually resulted in 15,000 ventures. It's actually, I'll take a step back, it's actually also been expanded to 20 different libraries outside of, outside of Syracuse. So that was where it started. Now it's in almost 20 libraries. But across all of the participants in this, there's been 15,000 ventures that have been launched. 8,000 companies have been incorporated. And get this, over 21,000 jobs have been created as a result of students working in a library facilitated program, Blackstone Launchpad. I, when I looked at this, I could hardly believe it. Uh, I think that, you know, talking about 21,000 jobs is the sort of thing, you know, a politician will come and do, then quickly forget after they've won the election. This is, this is students who had ideas, learned about them, and were able to apply them. And so let's think back to the spectrum that Bennett had put up there, that four stage moving from the idea that, okay, you're learning about a topic and, and then you, you take your test. Well, here's a case where I would argue we're at level three or four. These, these are not just business majors or music majors who happen to have an idea. These are business owners, people running successful businesses, creating jobs in the economy. Uh, and I considered that a rather incredible example of deeper learning approaches. Redesigning learning spaces. This is a trend that's been going on for a while. It was put into the midterm trend in the Horizon Report. Um, these are educational <coughs> settings designed for project-based interactions that support technology. Um, I have the example on here of the University of Iowa Learning Commons. Uh, of course, the Learning Commons here is fabulous. I, I, I saw that in the tour. It was packed full of people. Um, they all had their computers in front of them. There were a lot of conversations going. Um, it was, um, I think, you know, a, a great example um, as a, of a uh, redesigned learning space. I think, what did somebody, uh, Dan, you'd mentioned the cages. Was that where the cages used to be? There used to be book cages there. And, you know, I imagine that was probably also full. 
of people, uh, but uh, at this point, of course, it's been completely redesigned and is heavily utilized. Uh, and uh, again, an impressive example. I think a much more radical example, though, something that's really interesting in terms of space redesign is NC State's teaching and visualization lab. I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with this, uh, this particular space. Well, um, what uh, NC State has done is they've actually repurposed um, a lot of their space. And this particular visualization lab includes 270 degree projection on three walls. It's 3D capable. It's equipped for immersive instruction, including VR. Um, there was a have a coffee, coffee and viz program. So in the, in, the, in the morning, people come in with coffee and do a virtual reality exploration of a particular subject. Um, it can be used for all different uh, visualizations and simulations, including historical throwbacks and immersive looks at um, you know, historical artifacts and, and um, uh, sites. Um, it's been used as a big data decision theater and so forth. Um, one of the great examples, they actually have some use cases. This is something that sounds interesting to you. They have a series of examples. One that I, I thought was interesting was um, a simulation of a migration crisis. Uh, it was a simulation that was co-sponsored by the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Department of Political Science at NC State. Uh, and they actually brought in a a multidisciplinary cohort of students. So this included students in political science, history, and there were even nuclear engineers uh, students who were involved uh, in the simulation. Uh, the students used analytical, statistical, and writing skills um, to essentially address a realistic political crisis in this room in the library was used, uh, they used the imagery, the audio, and video capabilities to create this immersive experience. Um, again, I think we look at this and we think about that four stage progression in terms of learners and how the library can be in the center of that. Uh, and this is a situation where you're not just reading about it, which is important, it is critical, um, but you're actually trying to apply those skills. And how many of us in our professional careers, right as we you know, came out from, from learning, actually found out there can be a very big difference between researching and studying certain subjects and actually applying it. Well, these students are finding that out while they're still studying, while they're still in school, which I would consider to be a tremendous uh, advantage for them. So um, at this point, uh, you know, I have to point out again that there were, there were no lack of examples, and I could have actually filled up this entire time uh, looking at a whole bunch of examples of how libraries have actually been facilitating this kind of learning. Uh, you know, and, and you know, they've been finding a balance between the space that was used to accomplish these things uh, and the access to local collections. Uh, now, I should acknowledge here that some might argue that it's not the library's role to actually facilitate these kinds of programs. Maybe they think that uh, the departments or colleges or the universities should be doing these things, and in many cases, they're also doing them in addition to the libraries. Uh, and so I'd like to make the case very briefly that the library should be doing these things and is actually very well positioned uh, to do so. If you look at uh, University of Nevada Reno's makerspace uh, and your makerspace here, this was something that came up without even my, my prompting. I didn't ask any leading questions uh, to, the, to the gentleman giving us the tour. Uh, if you look at the makerspaces in NC State's teaching and visualization lab, they're available to all students in all departments and colleges across the campus. So I think you know, there's an opportunity for all, all of these colleges and students to enhance their education. The, the launch pad, again, it wasn't restricted to just business students who might be interested in entrepreneurship. A music major who maybe wants to sell their music online or an engineer who goes and uses the makerspace to create their, you know, their custom knives or their bike lock could then go use the launch pad to actually create um, a business using the support of the library. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning that the Blackstone uh, Launchpad actually is creating an entrepreneurship collection. They're directly locating it right around uh, that physical space, which brings up the point that the libraries are really the only institution in the position to integrate the wealth within the physical and digital collections with these particular programs. So in that sense, I think the libraries are in fact really the best 
suited to actually uh, support these particular learning programs and should be at the center of student success. One too quick. However, uh, if you agree with me or you don't, there are some practical considerations when we start looking at local collection footprints. Uh, and something I did want to cover and, uh, before we move on to looking at some more uh, issues in terms of collective collections. The first is, whether we like it or not, we've seen a decline in print book circulation in U.S. academic libraries. Since 2004, the decline has actually been fairly substantial. Um, and that's to begin with, uh, the, the circulation perhaps wasn't as high as we would have liked in the first place. And this is despite an overall increase in FTE. And so looking at this, again, this doesn't necessarily put a value judgment on books in them being important or unimportant, but it does suggest there is a trend that, that libraries need to take into consideration when they're trying to find balance. And these collections, of course, aren't small in terms of the opportunity cost in physical space. Um, this is a, a, an article that was written that estimated a 2.7 million volume collection would take up about 405,000 square feet. To put the picture in your mind, that's, that's equivalent to about seven U.S. football fields in normal stacks. So we're not talking about high density facility, facilities in this case. And once the books are there on the stacks, it's not free to keep them there. The cost of the books doesn't actually stop with just the purchase of the book. Um, in an article on, uh, the cost, on the cost of keeping a book, Paul Current came up with an estimate. He, he believes that books cost about $4.26. This was a 2009 estimate every year to keep on the stacks. In a high density facility, he estimated it was a fraction of that 86 cents. Well, uh, these numbers aren't without controversy. Not everybody agrees with these numbers, but what I think is important to understand here is that while this may or may not be the cost here, there is a cost. It's hidden sometimes in a facilities budget or an operations budget, but there is a cost to maintain these collections. And if we look at that 2.7 million volume collection that I mentioned earlier, what, what is that? That's about, uh, about $11.5 million according to Paul Curran's numbers. So again, if you don't buy his particular number, you know, find what yours is and actually, you know, actually define that. Uh, I think that in most cases it would be um, shocking. Once again, this isn't to say that it's not worth the cost, but there is a trade-off. It helps us determine uh, that balance. The other thing that we have to look at is redundancy. As I mentioned earlier, in the book-centered paradigm, libraries went about building uh, local collections but there wasn't a lot of coordination uh, among uh, the building of these collections. Now, to some extent, there were some external forces that I think really, really kind of dictated how these collections were built over the years. Um, for instance, accreditation drove, was driven by the number of volumes in your library. Status of library sometimes was just the sheer number of volumes um, that were, you know, uh, rep that were in a library's collection. This was something that was brought up in several conversations earlier today. But at this point, when that is largely not the case in terms of looking at accreditation, we have to review this. Uh, this graph represents a study that OCLC did in 2010. Um, at this point, Hathi Trust had digitized just about, I think, three and a half million volumes. And we wanted to see, of the volumes that were digitized, how many of their libraries globally held those same titles. Um, and we found that about 24% of what was digitized was held by 99 or more libraries. So a quarter of what was out there. And if you extrapolate this, and perhaps it's a representation of larger collections, perhaps not. This was just what was chosen for the Hathi Trust digitization. If you consider that a quarter of what is out there was held by another 100 libraries, we have to ask ourselves, was that really an efficient way to build the collection? Um, and of course, uh, if you look at this a little lower, 51%, um, so more than half of what was being digitized was held by 25 or more libraries. So there was, in this particular case, this, this little snapshot, quite a bit of redundancy. Now if we give, again, Paul Corrent the, the benefit of the doubt, 
and it costs $4 per volume to actually store all of these, and we look at this level of redundancy, uh, you know, I, we do have to ask ourselves, and I can't actually draw that calculation because I don't have the underlying data for this, uh, for this chart, just the summary. Um, but I think that the number would be probably staggering if we extrapolated that across the entire community. And when we talk about achieving a balance, we have to ask ourselves when we look at this, you know, if the redundancy wasn't there and there was a coordinated collaborative approach to building collections among research libraries, what else could that money have been spent on? Um, we've talked uh, earlier today, Dan and I talked about the special collections here, the AFL-CIO collection, uh, public broadcasting coll collection, a number of them. This, this is stuff that no one else has, no one. Um, maybe, maybe that would have been a, a way to orient the, uh, the, the money that was spent on uh, redundant collections. But what's, you know, this, this, this has already happened, and I think at this point the best way to look at this is, one, to recognize there is a lot of redundancy in, in the collections out there in, in the stacks. And two, when we're looking at prospective collection development, what should we do going forward? I think we should take this as a, as a lesson in terms of how we should um, coordinate our, our buying in the library community. And ultimately what that comes down to is finding the right balance. Um, I think that uh, um, fi finding the balance between local stacks and local and immediate access to collections versus creating different spaces and different learning experiences with libraries requires achieving a different kind of balance than what we see in most libraries. Now, what achieving balance does not mean, it does not mean, is arbitrarily discarding books. It does not mean that. Achieving balance does not mean harming the scholarly record, um, nor does it mean uh, negatively impacting patron access to materials, at least in any meaningful way. What achieving balance does mean is finding a sustainable means to manage collections both locally and in coordination with the community while also enabling a transformation from this book-centered approach to the learning-centered approach. And so that is pretty much a theme from this point forward in this discussion is what this is really about is finding a sustainable balance uh, for collections and the strategy of a particular library. There are libraries who are doing this today, and some in more radical fashion than others. Um, the first case in point is Arizona State. Uh, they've received a lot of attention over the last uh, several weeks. Has anybody seen some of the media coverage? I, I asked us in an earlier meeting. Uh, it, it's been fascinating to see uh, what, what they're planning to do and the reaction to it. They're looking at doing a $100 million renovation of their main library, and as part of that renovation, they're gonna move a very large part of their print collection to a campus about 20 miles down the road. Um, the director at the library doesn't like thinking of that off-site campus as off-site storage. He refers to it as a fulfillment facility. He makes a comparison to the what, what would most commonly be considered the off-site collection to a fulfillment, uh, fulfillment facility using Amazon as an analogy, Amazon Prime in particular. And he's saying, if a student needs one of these books, we will efficiently and quickly fulfill it, just like an Amazon Prime order would be, and send it to them on campus. Um, and then, uh, they, this, this trade-off, we mentioned the trade-offs earlier, you know, there may be, and if you look at, you know, I, I mentioned to someone earlier, some of the comments in the comment sections on these articles, it's a little more civil than the, than the, um, the YouTube comments, but, you know, there's some people who are really upset by this kind of approach. But what it represents is, I think, a balanced trade-off that, that Arizona State decided to make in possibly impacting patron access by a short period of time in order to enable a radical transformation of their main library space. It's not like they were saying there was zero downside, but they're trying to absolutely minimize it in order to achieve their mission. Um, and interesting, at the same time, if, you know, if uh, there's any inclination uh, that this means that they don't value print, they're also participants in the Book Traces project. Has, has anybody heard of, of that particular project, Book Traces? Well, the, the director there was a, a classicist uh, as well, and he um, actually is looking, he's having uh, 
volunteers look through books to find out if anybody has written in them. Have there, were there personal notes in the margins? Were there uh, cards that were put, in, put into the particular books? Things that would be valuable to genealogists or people who are studying particular scholars. Um, and they're actually um, conser or, or preserving those particular books. And so anybody who would view moving, you know, Arizona State as moving these off-site as not valuing books, I think is just is, is simply not interpreting their strategy correctly. And something, another case in point, something again we'll get back to, are some of the groups that Sustainable Collection Services, some of the group projects that Sustainable Collection Services has facilitated. In a group project, in the way we facilitate it, a group of libraries comes together and they take some piece or perhaps all of their collections and view them as a collective collection. It's one big collection among a group of libraries. Um, and what they're able to do once they come together is eliminate a great deal of the redundancy among those collections while also establishing a safety net that prevents any damage to the scholarly record and allows them to share any particular resources uh, between those libraries. This uh, is another example. Again, it is possible that a patron may have to wait a day or two to get a book that was previously low use, but it's enabling a tremendous opportunity for these libraries, anyone who participates in these groups, to repurpose their space very safely. And we'll come back to this. But that does bring us up to this idea of a collective collection or a facilitated collection. This is something that OCLC, as I mentioned, um, has spent a lot of time researching uh, and evaluating as an opportunity for libraries to expand what's available to patrons through sharing while simultaneously enabling uh, space reclamation uh, and transformation. Um, in 2016, Lorcan Dempsey, who I believe has already spoken or has spoken at this series in the past, and as OCLC's VP of Research and Strategy, he published an article called Library Collections in the Life of the User, Two Directions. I recommend it. It's actually a very straightforward read um, and actually describes something that I think could be very useful in terms of planning uh, and building a strategy from moving from an owned collection, what we see there on the left, to what he calls the facilitated uh, collection. So, interestingly on this, this blue line across the top is actually what he would consider a spectrum. The, the owned collection on the left, that's a purchased and physically stored collection. This is what Bennett, Scott Bennett would have called the book-centered approach. These are local collections. And along the spectrum of which any kind of a balance can be struck, again, coming back to that concept of balance, we eventually get to the opposite end of the spectrum of a facilitated collection. Now, a facilitated collection uh, is the idea of bringing together um, resources from a variety of different sources that may or may not be locally held or even owned by the library and assembling resources that are at your user's disposal. And in assembling a facilitated collection, Lorcan suggests a network logic be used. And the network logic says here, a coordinated mix of local, external, and collaborative services that are assembled. I like to think of this very much as you know, an example of my first PC back in the early 90s. I had a 100 meg hard drive on it. I had some word processing software, Lotus 123. I thought I had just about everything I needed. And then, of course, World Wide Web came up in the mid 90s, and suddenly you were plugged into an incredible amount of resources that were held by others, things that you wouldn't have even have thought you needed, but you do. It's essentially opened up an entire world, an entire different way of thinking. And you know, the, the, the way you could look at this is, well, do you want a PC that's unconnected, that has just your stuff on it, or are you gonna connect it to the web, where you essentially have resources from an incredible number of sources? Are you just going to have a local collection, or are you going to, of course, uh, connect it in with a lot of the opportunities that are out there. Along the spectrum, in order to move from this local owned collection to a facilitated collection, uh, Lorcan had put a, a variety of strategies, things to be considered, and we'll look into a few of these in more detail in a moment. Um, but essentially the idea is some libraries, based on their local needs, may uh, decide that they very much want to lean towards a local owned collection. There may be good reasons to do so. 
Um, on the other hand, uh, if they, you know, some may want to move slightly and slowly towards that facilitated collection, uh, you can incrementally do so by imp implementing several of the strategies that are, that are outlined here. And of course, there are others who have made more radical transformations uh, that we'll talk about in a, in a minute. The point is that this really can be used as an interesting template for developing that strategy. How quickly do you want to move from a local owned collection to a facilitated collection? And how do you want to address each of the strategies here, uh, if at all? One of the first strategies is the borrowed collection. Um, ILL, of course, is something that OCLC has been supporting for some time. There's many other services that are out there as well, but with the, the launch of TAPASA, the acquisition of Relay, uh, this is something that we uh, believe is crucial to facilitating a facilitated uh, collection uh, in the future. And I think particularly for individual libraries who may not be part of a group or deselecting, this is a very important part of a strategy. They may be deselecting or moving collections based on what they know others have, including borrowing partners, and the availability and ease with which they can get it. Now, shared print collections, and this is an area where uh, we come back to SCS group projects, um, came with a prediction uh, in, in Lorcan's article. Uh, it's, it's his prediction that the large part, perhaps the majority of library collections will be under shared print management within the decade. And again, this is the idea that libraries come together and view some part or all of their collection as a single collection. Um, there are um, examples of this, such as the East and MySpy project, uh, but there are also some more radical examples. This, I think, is an example here on the screen of somebody who decided to take a great leap on that spectrum that we looked at. Um, this is uh, an off-site facility that was jointly built by Georgia Tech uh, and Emory down in Atlanta. Um, and they put their, both their collections in there and they consider that their collection. And Georgia Tech moved 95% of the books out of their main collection and into this facility. And that, of course, allowed them to radically transform how they were using their space. Um, again, is, you know, this is a trade-off. Uh, is there a possibility that there could be a slight delay for a patron, you know, instead of having something in a local stack? Of course, that's the risk, but there's a risk they're willing to take in order to make a great leap forward uh, in other areas. And so what balance do you want to strike? And we shouldn't forget the opportunity in the shared digital collection. Um, this is another strategy being used to create that facilitated correct, uh, collection. Um, at this point, um, Haughty Trust, which is I think perhaps the best known example, has about 15 million titles in it. 38% of those are public domain. Uh, but there are other examples out there. Trove, uh, which is a digitization project from the National Library of Australia, um, actually has about 500 million items located in it. Not all of them books or articles necessarily, um, but these are, um, these are items that uh, could be added to a collection. The question we have to ask ourselves here is what kind of opportunity do we have to address physical collections with, the, with for instance, Haughty Trust? Um, if a book is actually on your stacks but has also been digitized and is available in Haughty Trust, um, does that help mitigate any impact? You know, I would argue it does, and actually in our decision support system, um, we include um, Haughty Trust as one decision factor in building scenarios uh, for libraries who wish to build retention uh, projects or uh, deselection projects. And ultimately, um, even if you don't use this as an opportunity to look at how you can change your fiscal collections, there is, of course, um, the opportunity to make these available through your discovery gateway and greatly expanding uh, patron access. There aren't a lot of libraries that have 15 million items. Now, not all of those are um, uh, publicly available, but say 5 million of them approximately are publicly available. Are those discoverable to your patrons at this point? Uh, why not, if, if, if not? Well, probably because it, it can take a lot of work to do so, but um, this is an opportunity to create that facilitated collection. It doesn't take any room. It adds to uh, your patrons, um, and it, uh, it doesn't have any cost for the materials, but certainly there's a cost for implementing it. 
Uh, and then I also wanted to address as one other strategy on the spectrum, the evolving scholarly record. This is something that often falls off the wayside uh, in a lot of discussions. Uh, but I think um, we, what we see and what I mentioned in my introduction is that there are a lot of emerging uh, topics um, and uh, disciplines out there that aren't necessarily well served by uh, traditional books uh, and resources. Um, as we're looking to, again, achieve that balance on, on the spectrum, um, adding some of these resources to the collection can make a lot of sense. A, a great example here is the University of California, Irvine's uh, machine learning repository. Um, this is actually a repository of data sets. Um, some people have hobbies such as gardening, my hobby happens to be machine learning. I, I enjoy it. Um, it's uh, uh, something, the UCI repository is something I've used on numerous occasions, uh, and it's not just me. This, this repository has actually been cited over a thousand times in scholarly computer science articles, making it one of the most cited sources in computer science. It's very valuable. It's not traditional. It's not a book that you could buy from a vendor or a journal you can get from um, from a, um, a journal vendor, it's something that you would have to make discoverable purposely. And so you have to ask, you know, are these the kinds of resources that are also available? Again, this is freely available. It doesn't take up any space. It has huge value to some emerging disciplines. Um, is, it, uh, is it something that's in your facilitated collection? Um, Cornell University, I should also mention, um, has another treasure trove, really, of scientific, um, really STEM papers, including computational finance and so forth. Um, all freely available to the library community. And finally, uh, looking at the, you know, achieving this balance, there are licensed collections and demand-driven collections, something, strategies I know that you're utilizing here, uh, and something that can be, uh, you can work with traditional vendors on, uh, licensing collections that can be added or dropped as programs require, uh, demand-driven, allowing you to add far more titles in a repository that students get to choose from um, without actually having to purchase them up front. Um, and so these, again, are strategies for moving from that idea of our local collection is here and, and it's in the stacks to this idea that our collection is there, but it is also uh, in hot, includes Hadi Trust. Our collection also includes Trove. It also includes the UCI machine learning repository and so forth. And again, each of these strategies can impact your space utilization. So let's say you've decided at this point that yes, okay, uh, let's go ahead and, and look at some kind of a, uh, a transformation. We want to find some different kind of balance on that spectrum between the local owned collection, the facilitated collection. You know, what are the kinds of strategies that we've seen people move forward with? Well, from a practical standpoint, um, there are really a, a range of options in terms of how to move and shift collections around. Compact shelving, something that's been heavily used here, um, of course, is, is, a, is, is a popular approach for consolidating collections. Uh, the, you know, the pro to this is it doesn't require an entirely new facility. Um, the con to this, of, of course, is you don't get that big gain in space reclamation that you might with other approaches. Uh, Off-site storage and regular stacks, we see a lot of the folks that we work with use this to actually shift their collections around in order to make space and, and again, find a different balance. Um, I think that this uh, has a great advantage in that it's straightforward, but there is a cost of facilities, it must be staffed, there can be delays in, in uh, fulfilling patron access. And, and I'll say that um, after taking a tour of your high-density facility, you are very lucky um, to have a high density facility here um, that has a lot of empty shelves on it. Um, I've got to work with a lot of different institutions. In fact, just last week, I was visiting a, a large ARL on, on the West Coast and their stacks are full and their offsite facility, it wasn't high density, that's also full and there's absolutely no possibility of a capital funding for an, a high density facility. And what are they going to do? That's, that's where they're at at this point. And that's a big problem. That's, that's a very difficult issue. Uh, they consider themselves very much a library of record. And they've gotten themselves into a pickle, so to say. Uh, so here, to come in and see a high-density facility with empty shelves, consider yourselves very lucky. It provides a lot of options 
in achieving the balance here, uh, you, you may have some easier trade-offs to make uh, than other uh, institutions, but that's not to say that some mixture of the options we're presenting here might not be appropriate. So, of course, that's a long-winded way of saying uh, off-site um, storage in high-density facilities is definitely an option. Not everybody's lucky enough to have the capital budget to do it. Most aren't. Uh, it's, it's fabulous that you have that. And then finally, deselection. Uh, one of the most controversial approach, uh, approaches to changing your collections. Uh, the, of course, this would refer to pulling titles from the shelf and donating them or discarding them entirely. Now the advantage to this is it's really inexpensive, it's very fast, and of course the disadvantage is uh, it could cause harm to the scholarly record and it could significantly impact patron access. The theme among all of these, when considering these, looking at how you want to achieve your balance, is for every single title in your library, you ultimately have to make the decision about where it should go. Should it go stay on your compact shelving in your local stacks? Should it go to your high density facility? Is there a reason to actually discard it? And that takes data. Uh, and that can be difficult uh, when, it, when it comes down to actually finding this data. Anybody who's actually tried to collect a, a lot of the data and pull it together so that you can make that decision for every title has found it probably uh, I would be very surprised if you hadn't found it to be enormously challenging. The data is oftentimes scattered, it's often very dirty, um, and sometimes it's quite frankly hard to wrangle uh, and control. So this is where SCS adds, I think, a lot of value to these kinds of projects and for folks who are looking at trying to achieve this kind of a balance. We'll actually come into libraries, and again, we're, we're working right now with USMAI, and this is a process that you will be going through shortly. We actually extract from your local catalog, this is where we start, your bib records, your item records, as well as any circulation data you might have. And surprisingly, not all, all circulation data is necessarily in the same system. Um, we spend an, an enormous amount of effort cleaning this data and pulling it into SCS systems and after we've cleaned it, normalized it, filtered it, done all different things that I've been on really long, agonizing conversations with data engineers, um, we actually then are in a position to match this to several external sources that will give you context for making decisions when you're trying to achieve balance within uh, your strategy. Uh, this includes Hathi Trust. We'll let you know if any particular book in your collection has been digitized by them, if it's public or in copyright choice, has it been reviewed, is it an outstanding academic title? Um, and then arguably the most important is WorldCat. How many other libraries in your state, in the country, or globally have that title? Either that exact edition or any edition related to it. Um, and then we go a step further than that um, and allow you to compare this to what we call our comparator groups. Do your ILL partners have a, n a number of copies of these books? What about your consortia? What about any other group that you can name? And then once this match has been made, it's actually loaded then into Greenglass, which is our decision support system. And this is the tool that we provide in this process for actually, again, you implementing uh, your strategy to achieve the balance on that spectrum that you chose to go with. Once the data's in green glass, there's really two approaches that libraries take in order to facilitate these transformations. The first is what we call independent action in a collective context. In other words, a library acting independently and making decisions on what should happen to any given title based on what they know about other collections in their state, uh, region, country, or globally. Uh, this is really difficult to read, the font's uh, small, um, but this is actually a screenshot from Green Glass. This is Central Michigan University. This is data from their project uh, that was completed about a year and a half ago. Um, and this visualization uh, is one of the things that they use to actually formulate a strategy. Um, what you're seeing here is on the y-axis is the number of items in their collection. Along the x-axis, we have bins that show how many other titles uh, in the U.S. are there for, for their collection. 
and you can see, so on the far right, that bar shows that uh, you can't, you probably won't be able to read this, but there's about, for every title in that bin, 200 or more libraries in the U.S. also hold that title. And that would be for about, about what, 375,000 titles of their 580,000 title collection. Overlaid on that bar, um, and the colors shows their circulation, or, or I'd, I'd rather say use of those titles. And so the light green is heavily used, three plus, and the black shows zero uses, as far back as they have circulation data. So if we come back to that far right bar, um, they have about 75,000 titles represented there that have never circulated since they had circulation data available and are held by more than 200 libraries in the United States. So if you are looking for an opportunity for a space reclamation, for moving a bunch of books down the interstate to your storage facility, uh, potentially for deselecting, that would probably be a good place to start your investigation. And those are the sorts of visualizations, that's the sort of approaches that, for instance, Arizona State, who has signed on uh, with Sustainable Collection Services to help facilitate their renovation in the programs I mentioned earlier, this is the sort of deliberation and evaluation that they'll be going through. Uh, and in Green Glass, there's about 42 different ways um, a library can visualize their collection and, and develop their strategy. This actually shows uh, Central Michigan's collection by publication year, and the colors overlaid again are recorded uses. One of the things I thought was interesting here is, remember going back to Bennett's assertion that the book center paradigm really is a product of the 20th century. I mean, you know, Central, you know, if you look at the growth of this particular collection, I think he may have a point uh, here. Uh, anyway, uh, just a side point. Uh, so, uh, once people have gotten a feel for their collection and have developed their strategy, they're able then to move into what we call the query builder. Uh, this is something, again, uh, you'll see in your context when you begin working with us. But the query builder allows anyone with just point and click use. This doesn't require any programming, nobody needs to know SQL, you don't have to be a, an Excel jockey, uh, can actually come into the interface and run any number of scenarios. This happens to be a, a withdrawal candidate list that was created uh, by somebody at Central Michigan. Um, it's just a scenario, it doesn't require that anybody actually implement it, um, but they're looking at recorded uses, when was the last charge date for titles, um, when was it added, um, how many other people have, how many other libraries have this in, in the United States and Michigan uh, in order to try to evaluate a title list and then once they were able to run the scenario they found that oh this matches about 9.2 percent of the collection and then they can download a list with all the data that's available uh, and begin making uh, decisions if they so choose. So this is um, kind of individual action in that collective context. The approach that we'll be looking at with USMAI and we took with East and MySpy and several other group projects um, is this, and this goes back to what I had mentioned earlier when I talked about East and MySpy, which is developing essentially a shared print program with a collective collection mentality. Uh, and so all of these libraries took some part or all of their collections and said this is our joint collection and we're going to analyze this and build a safety net. Um, just like the individual approach uh, for group collections, uh, libraries can also visualize the aggregate collection, so this is everybody together, what does your collection um, look like, and begin formulating those strategies. Um, and then once they do, instead of the query builder, they actually come into what we call the model builder. And some of this, again, I apologize, the, the font's uh, um, rather small. But here they can come in and begin looking at um, a variety of rules-based scenarios that allow them to determine um, how, what, what they should do in terms of building a safety net and allowing others to deselect. And so keep in mind, we'll, come, we'll actually come back to this slide, but I think an example would probably be uh, in order here. Here is actually the rules that East used uh, to build their particular model. Uh, and keep in mind, a big difference between uh, a query building, an individual approach, um, in a group approach in the model builders, the model builder is a retention first view. First we build the safety net, 
then that enables optional deselection among the other participants if they choose to do that. So East went through the visualizations. They went through a lot of meetings to determine what their strategy and objectives were. They actually, and they didn't use these terms, but they actually tried to figure out where do they want to get on that spectrum uh, between local collections and facilitated collections. What balance, in other words, did they want to achieve? Well, here they were particularly concerned um, about protecting the scholarly record. That was very important to them, but space reclamation was also critically important. So they, they set up a three-pronged strategy. They said, we're gonna retain all of the titles that are in place today if East Holdings are fewer than five across all 40 plus libraries. The, there's there's uh, 40 or fewer uh, editions of this title in the United States. Uh, our comparator groups ha and have uh, relatively few and it's within our realm and they were looking at just titles for 2011. And so that set of rules was what they considered the sparse, sparsely held titles. They wanted to protect these. If, if, these were if there were few of these available, under their comfort levels, they wanted to make sure that these would actually be part of the safety net. The next part of their strategy was we don't want to impact <coughs> patron access. Um, we, we want to, if something has shown a great deal of use, we want to make sure we have multiple copies um, so that we can actually supply that demand. Um, and so they created a simple rule. We're going to retain five titles um, if aggregate uses are more than 30, 30 across all of the 42 institutions. Five titles will be retained. And then there was the catch-all. This is the safety net, uh, the fail-safe at the bottom. They're going to retain one title of everything, everything else. And so if you were to look at this and you were to think, okay, well, 40 libraries got together and they put these rules up there uh, in term, across all of their collections. What percentage of your collection, what percentage of the collections available do you think that would require? them to retain in order to achieve this complete safety net? What percentage of their collections? I'd be interested in a couple of guesses. A few of you know the answer already because we, we talked about this, you're disqualified. 20. 20%? 40. 40? Okay, you guys, you guys straddled it. I'm gonna go back up here to my very small slide. It was actually 36%. So, 30, so each library on average, so what the model builder did is said, okay, we'll look at your rules and we're actually going to try to distribute the requests to achieve what you put in the model builder as equitably as possible. And that came out to roughly 36%. Uh, 36 there, there's one, you can see um, each library as one of the dots on here, the green line is, is actually the average. There's one library that had a bit more, and it was just because their library had a unique, um, a, a unique build that the model builder was not able to, under any condition, uh, pull them down to the average. But everybody was pretty close to 36% and straddled this, the, uh, the guesses uh, that were, were out here. Uh, now, if you wanted to change this, and, and I'm sure uh, East went through, I think, maybe a half dozen or a dozen different models, and as they changed the rules, um, uh, in the model builder, this graph actually shifts to show the impact on every single library. Uh, and I think that um, looking at this from the flip side is what makes it most interesting to those who want to facilitate a major transformation in the library. If you only had to retain 36% of your holdings in order to have a complete safety net, that means the other almost two-thirds you have the flexibility to do whatever you want with them. Now, that's not necessarily saying that they're going to throw them in the dumpster or put them in the, you know, down in the bunker down the interstate for storage. Uh, you know, some of them are planning to just keep them in place for now and not take any action on them. But if you had a major transformation agenda, this gives you a lot of leeway if you could take two thirds of your collection and, and actually move it elsewhere. That's a, quite a bit. And again, that's across 42-ish libraries uh, in this particular group. And so that's why um, we're particularly excited about this approach. We believe that it does help libraries strike that balance based on whatever strategy they would like to pursue. Um, and I think that there's a, a, a lot of potential. Uh, it doesn't force anybody to do anything but keep the titles that they've agreed to retain. 
um, but they have the flexibility to massively transform their space if they choose to do so. And so that's why we've taken this approach. Um, that's not to suggest that the individual approach, uh, uh, deselecting in a collective context, isn't valid. I think that that also um, has a, um, a, lot, a lot of validity. Uh, I think it's also a safe way to approach this, but, but this over across a group, and it's the approach that USMAI has chosen, um, is something that I think can make remarkable progress in a very short period of time. So we've been at this for a while, uh, and one of the things I, I would like to do is talk about um, how we see this evolving um, as, as a way to close up in, in my final section. Um, I think that, uh, as I mentioned, there's huge potential in facilitating shared print programs, which is why we put a lot of emphasis on this. It's one of the reasons that after the acquisition of SCS that that uh, OCLC wanted to see the uh, group functionality um, launched. And I think that we've seen some good results so far, but I really hope this is just the beginning. Um, so if we look at what SCS has done in terms of shared print retentions, we've worked with about nine groups at this point. That represents about 129 institutions, so a little less than half of the, the libraries we've worked with have actually been in this group context. Um, about 18.5 million title holdings have actually been retained. Now this is, considering this has been launched in about 2016, there were some manual projects before, this is you know, coming up to 20 million titles retained in just a few years, when previously there were essentially zero. Um, we've operated in about 13 US states and, and five uh, Canadian provinces. Um, and if we look at the distribution of titles uh, by group that we've worked with, I think there's a couple of interesting takeaways. Um, first of all, uh, if you look at the uniquely retained uh, titles by a particular group, and again, these are unique between the groups, not within the groups, um, you can see that there's quite a bit of uniqueness between these programs. Um, I think that this, this shows that uh, the scholarly record at the national level um, is actually finding some protection on a very large scale here. Um, the other thing that's interesting, if, if we look at the, um, the, the overlap of these groups, is it suggests that if these groups got together, there could also be tremendous opportunity for further uh, collaboration and reducing that 36% that level we had there. I think that could be further pushed down by intergroup cooperation. Now that's, uh, that, that may, be, may be getting ahead of ourselves at this point. I think we need to expand uh, a lot of the impact of the group projects. Uh, if we look at uh, where we've operated thus far, the shared group projects have really been uh, northeastern centric. I don't have a particularly good explanation for why uh, they're northeastern uh, centric. I think a lot of the founders of SCS live in the northeast. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's the reason. Uh, but I think there's also a lot of space issues out here uh, that maybe have yet to catch up with some of the younger uh, libraries that haven't been operating as long uh, in the, uh, the west coast and south, southwest. Uh, that said, uh, we have begun some work with Skelk, and so we will hopefully see some representation uh, on the west coast uh, soon enough. And Canada has actually also gotten into this. I've mentioned that uh, COPAL was one of our projects. Uh, this has led to uh, hundreds of thousands of retention uh, commitments, uh, but I think there's probably more to be gained there as well. Uh, and when I look at this, this map, um, it's really my sincere hope that in the next several years, we'll see some level of retention commitments in every state. Uh, the reason, of course, and hopefully I've, I've conveyed this throughout this conversation, is that I think the opportunity to transform libraries, the opportunity to find the balance that we had mentioned earlier on that spectrum between local collections and facilitated collections, that opportunity will increase, I think, proportionally with the number of retention commitments that we see show up on this map. Um, these will essentially represent flexibility for libraries uh, to move in whatever direction that their strategy deems they should move. And so with that, um, I'd like to um, open it up for any questions or discussion. Yes? Uh, I 
a bit late. I apologize. I was just casually wandering uh, through the campus and stopped in the portal and saw the poster for this. Uh, I didn't read it up here so much as I saw the title and thought I'd come up. I presume I'm the least successfully educated person in this room. Uh, notwithstanding that, I have spent a lot of time in my life in libraries, mostly many years ago. University libraries, large public libraries. And uh, I'm curious, apparently you're with an entity that uh, advises library systems on how to, on their space usage and how to retain. My own experience, and I think it's been the experience of people that I've talked to over the years, is that when one's wandering down the aisle, uh, that might contain uh, titles relevant to one's interest, one will come across something that's never, that one's never seen before. It just, I would take it from the shelf and you can spend hours doing going through that. And I have no way of knowing uh, the previous usage of that title or the subsequent usage of that title. I'm scared, however, I think, uh, based on what I've heard, that that potential may not be available in the future for folks just to wander idly through the library, come across the title, and wander idly through it, uh, because of a whole number of things, including these selections, which is very scary. Right, yeah, and, and this is something, uh, what you've brought up is something that comes up uh, on, I'd say, 90% of the, the campuses we discuss, uh, particularly when we have conversations with faculty. Um, and a lot of people refer to this as kind of serendipitous discovery, you know, walking through the stacks and, and being able to just kind of see what's there. Uh, and this is certainly, I think, one of the trade-offs that we have to look at. We have to look at or make assumptions really in this case. I don't believe there's been a lot of studies about um, the, the idea of serendipitous discovery and you know how what value across the student body it adds to research. We, we don't have those numbers to you know one way or the other. Um, but there has to be this trade-off between do we maintain a large number of stacks of print collections that are decreasing in circulation that are expensive to store for the opportunity for serendipitous discovery, or do we move discovery more to an online experience where the, you know, it's not the same experience, but it gives people the opportunity to use full text indexed books, um, scanned books, um, and then at least be able to look at the titles and the summaries of pages uh, of books that may not have been scanned in the past and move discovery to that in order to free the space to provide the opportunity for libraries uh, to reutilize that space and to save costs. It's a trade-off. Is it possible that, it, you know, that moving forward with moving stacks to an off-site facility could disrupt a discovery that would have been made? It is possible. There, there's no way to deny that that could happen. But again, what we're talking about here is having to make a, a decision about the direction you want to go with the, with the library. Is, is that possibility that you know, the serendipitous discovery could be, could be disrupted and not replaced digitally worth the uh, opportunity cost of not being able to reutilize your space and not being able to move your budget to other expenses? It is, it is a decision, and it is, it is a risk, quite honestly. We have time for a couple of other questions. My question is, uh, among the groups that you are now working in terms of uh, uh, collection management, um, do you see a trend towards collective collection development policy, development, collection development policies on a collective basis? Yeah, another very good question. So we, we mentioned this when we talked about, you know, when I talked about the redundancy of collections. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see that there was not a lot of discussion about that in the past. And so it's, it's fair to say, well, now are we seeing it? You know, ironically, 
you know, it, it wasn't during the time where, you know, budgets were, were flush, if, you know, relatively speaking, that people were looking at cooperative collection development and actually implementing it. And of course, people were always talking about it. But it may actually be these kinds of projects, uh, shared print projects um, and deselection projects that are getting people to recognize and start to talk about in earnest uh, cooperative collection development policies, um, looking at the result of uh, some of the policies of the past. So to directly answer your question is, yes, there, there have been, I think, some serious conversations about actually implementing cooperative collection development practices. Have I seen it actually happen and you know, go in place? I, I have not yet at this point. But I think for the first time, people are seriously considering it as a, uh, as a strategy rather than just talking about it as a kind of utopian you know, goal. Yes. Oh, thank you for the program. Um, my question is about um, um, you said you extract the the records from the catalog. Okay, upload to OCLC and do the analysis, and but that's based on the OCLC source records, right? So we'll so I have asked Rick this question before and want to see whether there's any improvement in terms of what if the catalog contains non OCLC source records? Well, how could 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 that be you know uh, resolved in terms of doing comparison? Okay. Uh, so let let me make sure I understand your question. Are, are you are you concerned with matching of local records to WorldCat holdings in, in terms of what records in WorldCat and determining how many holdings there are for those records? Well, let me explain a little bit. Uh, actually, I'm from Georgia, okay. <laughs> um, used to be here, but then you know, left with, uh, no, now working at Georgia. Uh, but my previous job was in Hong Kong. So there are a lot of records that are not in OCLC. At all, and that's why I went to Rick and asked him about uh, this uh, the solution, and he said no, <laughs> because there's no way to compare it. So it's been what almost two years, almost three years. So I just want to find out if there's any mechanism to um, make sure that I mean, especially you know, a lot of foreign libraries, yeah, they're not OCLC members or they don't contribute to OCLC and. But they might download the records from OCFC, but they may or may not be members. So, right. Yeah. yeah, so in, in the case, so we originally start with, one, one of the reasons we originally start with the library's catalog rather than start with, with WorldCat is not everything is always set uh, from a library in WorldCat. Uh, and so we pull the bib and item records uh, as well as circulation data, as I mentioned, from the local catalog, clean that, and then try to match it. Um, if there, you know, if we have a large corpus of material in a collection that doesn't happen to be in WorldCat, it would be problematic uh, in terms of making matches. In other words, the usefulness might be uh, diminished if there isn't a way to match a large portion of a local collection to any kind of, of WorldCat holdings. You wouldn't be able to, for instance, create a rule that says if 50 other libraries, uh, you know, have this and it's been digitized in Hathi Trust, then we'll take X action. That that would be that would be limited uh, in that sense. And so I think that that's a I think Rick's answer is probably still you know, valid at this point. That if there is a huge portion of titles not in WorldCat, it would be difficult uh, to facilitate that kind of a, a project. Um, so for a lot of, for instance, non-English language titles that may not be represented in WorldCat. Now, I'll flip that around a little. If you have a situation where you have a lot of local records where you haven't set the holding in WorldCat, uh, but there is a record of some kind in WorldCat, um, or you don't have a, an OCLC number on your record, um, we, as part of our cleaning process, will assign the OCN, the OCLC number, um, on that record within Greenglass. We're not gonna go back to your catalog and update your catalog, um, but we'll actually um, add that data in there. We'll add uh, other bibliographic elements 
Um, we do a whole variety of checking, and so if the opposite were true, where you had records that just had never been matched, we take care of that as part of the process. However, in your, your scenario, that, that one is, there's not a lot we can do about that if they're simply not represented in WorldCat, um, if there is no bib record to begin with in WorldCat. It's just, just not there. That, that, would be, that would be problematic. Uh, we wouldn't be able to create those in WorldCat, for instance. Um, on the other hand, there may be uh, another avenue for you to work with you know, other groups within OCLC to add to WorldCat, and over time, then project would, would make more sense. So, yes, question. In determining which items to save in a pooled collection, um, is any um, regard given to condition of the item? Like that the items that are retained <coughs> are the ones that are the, in the best condition of all the items held? Yeah, the quick answer is no. Uh, we, we don't look at any sort of validation level um, within the, uh, uh, that data would have to essentially be sent to us in order to have you know, considered that. It's not something that even, even if a, a library had collected that and was able to send it, it's not something right now that, that Green Glass um, would consider. However, one thing you could do is if you had that data um, available to you, you ran uh, a query and were willing to match it manually, um, once you've exported uh, results uh, and you had conditions, you could match that outside of Green Glass. But in terms of automatically incorporating uh, the validation or condition level, um, that's not something that, that Green Glass does at this point. So, I mean, the risk, of course, there, what I, I feel you're getting at is, how do you know among the groups, you know, is the person who's getting the retention request, uh, is, is their book full of mold or broken or, you know, even there? You know, that was a, a question uh, for the group retention projects and EAST, actually, um, as part of their project, did what they called the validation study. And they went out and looked and said, okay, well, how many of the books that our records say are on a shelf and in usable condition actually there and usable? And it was in the high 90 percent. 90%. Uh, there were a few percent that were not there when they were supposed to be there. Uh, and so they actually took that, and that's publicly available, that study. It was, I think, Mellon funded. And they um, took that into account when creating their rules uh, to try to you know, facilitate this risk that something might not be there, might not be usable. Yes. So I was recently at a um, professional conference around my subject area of librarianship and we were discussing uh, trying to explore collective collect management of collections across our sub institutions around our subject area. Do you have any cases of this, of this? Most of what you presented was kind of regional collaboratives, so I'm specifically interested in subject area collaboratives that could be national or international. Are you thinking of this in terms of, you know, could a group project look at, um, you know, certain, certain subjects or? Yeah, well, also I'm thinking of, so we're part of land grant institutions. So I'm the agriculture natural resources librarian, so there's a, network of land grant institutions and then also a national agriculture library so I think our goal in doing this kind of work is to make sure there's uh, copies of agricultural materials across the research institutions and at the national agricultural library right so so one of the approaches you could you could take here and I pulled up green glass I'm in the individual side of this um, uh, this is, uh, again, the Central Michigan um, account. Is, this is their live data, what they, they were using to make decisions. Um, and they're part of the Michigan Share Print Initiative. I mentioned there's about 4,000 retentions there. Um, and so they, they know from the group project what has been retained across the group. So they establish their safety net. And at this point, then they have the, the freedom to actually make various decisions. And, and you, you can actually drill down by subject classification. We don't use LC, we don't use subjects, we use the LC the subject classifications um, in here. And so you, you could, oops, mouse is very sensitive. You could, you could begin to drill down on an individual, sorry, very sensitive mouse here. You could begin to run any sort of queries and scenarios based on whatever subject areas you would like 
um, once you know um, what, what have you've been allocated uh, to keep, you can make sure that any of those are not part of the, the query or it's con it considers those so that they wouldn't be part of your list. Um, but you could begin drilling down by subject and begin doing some fairly interesting analyses of the books at any given institution in the context of the group safety net for agriculture or any, any of the, the LC subjects. Does that answer your question? Yes. So would it be only institutions that had participated in Green Black, or would it be any ones that were in, in World Cup? So in this case, it would be, this would be taking into consideration uh, Central Michigan, MySpy, and any of the comparator groups that they selected. Um, what this wouldn't do is look at this from a national level and say for all you know, ad collections across the entire, uh, entire country. What you may want to look for there um, is the, the World Share Collection Evaluation, which is a general collection uh, evaluation product that OCLC also offers. And its use case is more of a general collection analysis, um, gap analysis, for instance. Um, it would say things like, what, what does another library have that we don't have? It takes that perspective, whereas this says, what do other libraries have that we also have so that we can begin making decisions together to create safety nets and eventually uh, um, you know, um, move, move stuff offside or clear space and so forth. So the use cases are, are different on the two products, but that might, if you're looking for some sort of like national analysis um, of collections, that may be the way you would want to go rather than, rather than this, this particular approach. That, that kind of answer your question? Well, yeah, I can see both of them being of interest. I mean, maybe the goal is to get this professional group to become an entity on here to look at. Right, and, and uh, the group projects we do don't necessarily need to be traditional consortia. Uh, it can be any library, any group of libraries that would want to come together. You know, if there were a core of agricultural libraries who were, you know, the leading collections in that area, um, they could very, we could very much facilitate a group project and establish again that safety net to make sure that at least one book of you know one book is retained in, in uh, among those libraries, so there isn't inadvertent weeding and deselection that leads to a loss to the scholarly record. I mean that we could very much facilitate that kind of a scenario. So okay, <laughs> there was another. Oh, I'm sorry. I think we have time for one more. Yes. Thanks for this really great uh, presentation, Matt. Thank you. In all of the libraries that you've worked with, has there been a running theme that compels them to get from a book-centered library to more of a learning-centered uh, environment so that they can let go of those millions and millions of books when they know that there are there is that safety net. I love that idea of that safety net. Um, do you find some themes that help um, institutions and their colleagues and employees to sort of say, okay, let's give this a try? Yeah, and, and are you referring to looking at, uh, say, within a library or the, the, the campus faculty? Really, the, maybe a combination, but starting first with the library yeah. and its employees to say, this is a possibility for us to look at how we can reclaim some space and that redundancy that is so evident can be reduced. Right. I, you know, I think, uh, Prior to, you know, what I'd mentioned that uh, back when both Rick and I, you know, others <coughs> were at R2 Consulting, we were workflow consultants. Um, what we found there, of course, was what you're describing, which is a lot of libraries who were essentially crowding out their users and so forth. Um, and we often would have discussions with them um, about the space issues and what they would like to do to, to mitigate this, but there wasn't a lot of data to actually make hard decisions about this. And that lack of data led to essentially really subjective conversations that weren't really based in any kind of, of fact or numbers, uh, and it was uh, essentially almost inevitably a tail-chasing exercise 
or a big personality within the library would come in and just do it. You know, somebody who had uh, essentially the, the political clout to survive that kind of a decision. Uh, and, and so what you're describing was one of the things that actually really led to the inspiration for founding SCS in 2011 as a small independent company was to, was to inject data and knowledge into that conversation. And it's really amazing almost to see what happens when, you know, you have a lot of people where there's a lot of emotions. There's people who are nervous about deselection and for good reasons. If it's done poorly, you can't hurt the scholarly record. Um, you know, and, and that isn't a good trade-off when it comes to, to clearing space. And so that was really the, the purpose here was having a product that could inject data into the conversation and allow people to make decisions based on that data. And it has been amazing to see how um, suddenly the conversations that, you know, can be very, you know, you know very emotional tend to settle down. Uh, and people will, will begin to look at the numbers and the data, see whatever everybody else has. They look at the opportunities that are available to the library, uh, and then people kind of, they just get to work. Um, it's been, um, you know, gratifying in a way to see that, you know, some of these very large programs with millions of retention, um, um, re retention commitments have happened over a period of months. You know, you know some very, very, a lot of very big decisions because they had the data, they were able to run whatever scenario they wanted, and then as a group they could come and look at the pros and cons with concrete examples. Um, and then they were able to take the visualizations and screenshots to the faculty, to their stakeholders, and show exactly why they made those decisions. And that alone has actually resulted um, in forward momentum and forward action in a lot of libraries where just nothing had happened for decades. So I hear you saying that evidence-based that we have in a green glass product makes this possible, correct? Yes, I mean, that's, that's my contention, is that having the data um, makes all of the difference when it comes to actually moving forward with the program, even if there's been no progress for many, many years. Um, and it is that idea that it's a responsible and informed Deselection, if deselection has to occur, occur, or a movement to an offsite facility and so forth, that gives people a lot of confidence um, that uh, a collection can be managed, uh, can be, you know, deselection or moving of collections can take place in a responsible way if you have the data to make the right decisions. So that, that is, that's essentially would be my contention. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Well, Thank you, Matt. Will uh, you all join me in thanking Matt?